Welcome to the Poker Road Radio Show, hosted by Gavin Smith, Joe Seabock, and Bart Hansen. The Poker Road Radio Show is the only poker radio show that's been resurrected more times than Jesus and Lazarus put together. And welcome, everyone, to Poker Road Radio, the debut show. I am Bart Hansen, joined by Gavin Smith and Mr. Yo. Phil and Barry Greenstein, filling in here for... Uh, Joey Seabock, and uh, thank you all for joining us on our, again, our first show here from WPT Falls View in Ontario, Canada. And, uh, you know, Gavin and Barry, we are at the dinner break of this event. Uh, day one of a three day event, we had 180 people. Uh, here in day one, there were 497 entrants last year, so it looks like it's going to be more than last year. Again, uh, I'm sure it'll get bigger on tomorrow and Sunday. You know the growth of poker, and you know the topic. I'm sure in everybody's mind is where is Joey Seabock? Where is Joe? where is Joey Seabock? Poker Road Radio. You know, well, you know, you, you know how kids always lie to their parents. Of course, <laughs> I'm here proving that you're all you're a parent your whole life. You know, once you have kids. Joey got stopped at the border, and, you know, what he told me, I don't know what the truth is. He told me he had a library book that was overdue, <laughs> <laughs> and that they found out, uh, you know, and, and that they just wouldn't let him through. He had to go back to the public library. I don't know. Did he tell you guys well, anything? Well, I was, I was actually there with Amanda Leatherman, so I can kind of fill you in. Did, so, they, did they put him in shackles? No, well, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you the brief story. So we fly in from L.A. to Cleveland and Buffalo, and we rent the car, and we drive up, and everything's fine. Listen to the Red Sox game. Game number two. And, you know, we drive up to the booth, customs. We've never had a problem. And the guy asks us what we're doing. And Joe says, he's driving. He says, well, we're going up to the casinos. And he says, what are you going to do there? We're covering a poker event. He says, okay, okay. He gives us a yellow form. And he says, you've got to go inside and check in. And we were, like, scratching our heads because that really hadn't happened before. I'd never seen it happen before. So we pulled the car over, and we go inside. And uh, we go to another customs agent. Custom agents says to Joe, you know, what are you doing in Canada? He's like, well, we're going to the casinos. And she says, well, are you working in Canada? And he said, no, we're not working. We're just going to the casinos. And then she said, well, what's your business? And then he said, well, we're covering the poker tournament. So she's like, oh, so you are working in Canada. And you can see how it went downhill from there. She took our passports, and apparently she ran Joe's, I guess Canada, you know, can run some sort of criminal background check. And apparently on Joe's criminal background check, there are these unknown arrests from when he was uh, 19 or 20 that he didn't mention to the customs officer. Or to Barry. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, what actually happened is someone used his name. Yeah. It was an identity theft type oh. thing. Somebody used his name, and actually sure. we even found out that they, the reason they used his name is someone got stopped, like, doing something. Uh, I don't know, with, with drugs or whatever it was. And they just, and the police said, well, who are you? And, they, and the guy tried to think of someone he knew would have a clean record. So he wasn't even trying to nail Joe. He was trying to get away from the police. So he said, oh, Joe Seabach, figuring it was a clean record. Well, they took the name down, and then it popped up sometime when Joe was trying to get a passport, and he had cleared it off his record about eight years ago. Well, he thought he cleared it off his record. And then he's traveled all around the world. No one's ever said anything. And this is the first time someone said, no, that's on your record. This is one of the reasons we told Joe to legally change his name to Joe Seabach Greenstein. Because <laughs> then it wouldn't have shown up. If he had, be, if he had been Joe Seabach Greenstein here, he'd have been here i got to tell you, the, kick, the kicker to the story, though, is that that person that used Joe's name, he was arrested not only for drug traf- trafficking, but for illegal immigrant smuggling from Mexico into California. <laughs> so you can... You Joey's can, got some good friends yeah, here, right? Yeah, right? You can understand why the Canadian authorities were a little bit concerned. What I want to know, though, is why do we have to suffer? Well, <laughs> uh, 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 customs turned down Joe. Now we got to put up with Barry for a week? No, only... I'm always nice to Barry. Well, maybe Canada only has the right idea, to. you know? You know, huh? not letting Joe in. Maybe they got the right idea. You're Canadian, right? I know, but I mean, it's, it's, it's wrecking our show. I mean, Barry, Barry's going to sit here and be a bump on the log and tell everybody, you know, to play tight and all that kind of crap. And it's just not going to be nearly as entertaining as if we had Joe Steebach Greenstein. So, so what you're saying is you don't think I'm going to be funny. Is that what you're I don't think to say? you're going to be any good at all. I think that, I think that you're, now, you're a marginal poker player and a horrible radio host. Well, see, you think, you think everything's funny because usually you're so drunk. You, like, giggle <laughs> and laugh, you know. Yeah, I always, you know, I, I was never a drinker, and I was just watch guys like you at college, and they, they just, everything's hysterical. I'm sure you've gone, you've been drinking and walked by the Niagara Falls and just start going, that's just funny. Look at the water coming down, and had a good laugh. It is funny. Yeah, yeah see, exactly. The only time I ever drank in college was so I wouldn't have to put up 
with guys like you. Uh, we well, see, there's why, where we got like sort of a catch-22. The only reason I drink is so I can put up with guys like you. <laughs> okay, well, maybe you got a point there. Story, Amanda went, goes back over the border today again, comes back, and we, she actually sees the same guy that when we first drove up. Did he recognize and, her? And he recognized her, and he says, well, where are your two male friends? And she's yeah. like, what? Uh, and uh, he said to her... That if she, that if he had known that she didn't work for the WPT, he thought we worked for the WPT, right. and that's why he pulled us over. I'm not sure if why we you guys were independent. Didn't... We would have just gone right through. He why said didn't you guys just say you're going right to play a poker tournament? I don't know. Joe just said we're covering a tournament. That's why you guys how he gotta... said it? You well, why? Uh, why would... I still don't get why they stop. It, why they don't like the WPT? Apparently, at the border? they well, were stopping everybody that had thing, something to do with. The, uh, maybe it's the money the issue. The thing is that you guys should have understood is that last year there was considerable trouble for a lot of the WPD employees to get through last year. There was a lot of trouble. So, I oh, mean, okay. you had to know that maybe you would have said we're going to play instead of we're going I mean, to go. They've there, there been a lot of hassles at this border. I mean, I thought it was a friendly it, border was, instead of a hostile border. There was no line border. either. We just, you know, went right now, up. But. Now that our dollar's worth more than yours, we just don't think, I know, we, that, we just don't really want anything to do with you guys. That's you know? unbelievable. I mean, moving along to this event, guys, we're at the dinner <laughs> break. How, how are you guys doing so far in this event? Um, I am doing, I'm having a rough day. I, I've been down as low as 6,000. I don't think I've ever been above 20. I just won the last hand before dinner break. I had to make a pretty tough call, and uh, I did it and won the pot. So I'm up to about probably 16,000 right now. 16,000, and you, Barry? Um, I uh, got up to 27,000 right away, uh, flop and set against an overpair. Then I uh, called to, to draw out a flush, made a pretty big call, and missed down to 20. Then I busted a guy with kings against jacks up over 30. I actually got up to 44. And then I bluffed off 10 down to 34, and then I ended up at 39. So 39 is decent. I'm, I'm okay. And uh, I, I've, I've got a pretty good table. So uh, And, and uh, my main incentive for hanging in the tournament right now is that Joey's not here, and I'm going to have to stay here for a while, around. so I might as well stay in the tournament. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I don't want to suggest anything illegal, but I think if I was Joey, I would have uh, gone in someone's trunk and – gotten here <laughs> i just said why don't you try to go in another access point yeah right another another access point. Point well i'm sure There's that they, 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 yeah, yeah. they that probably would be dangerous because yeah. they probably have his name and if yeah. you got if you did get caught then then it would be then, right. then they would definitely and, unless uh, the only way i try uh something is if they didn't say you definitely can't do anything depends how serious well, they, they didn't made stamp it. i was afraid they were going to stamp him as a denial where right. they always have but yeah. they didn't have any but if they made it like iffy like you know we can't let you through, Until but nothing more. Yeah. No, if they just said, we can't let you through, then I, at least we, you, you could have said, well, that doesn't mean someone else won't let me through. Because the fact is, Joey hasn't done anything. Right. He's my son. He's innocent. He would never do that. Gavin, on the other hand, probably should not be let in the United States oh, going know. the other direction. Who, who knows about that? No, yeah. no, I should be. Actually, I don't have any, any uh, blemishes on my, on my sure. criminal record. I, sure. I, how how many times did you wake up not knowing what happened the night before? How I, do you that know? has happened a few times. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so no blemishes that you remember. But okay. I, I, I'd be willing to bet that's also happened to Joe. So Yeah, well, you know, okay, okay. If you're, you're going to paint me with a brush, paint your kid with the same brush. All right yeah, there. but see, he's never told me about that. Reading these event updates, it says that there are not a lot of big-name pros in here on day one, that there are a lot of Internet pros. Does that tend to, say, toughen up the field? What do you think about the field right um, now in comparison to well, other Yeah, events? those guys are just scary. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I know you're <laughs> very <fair. laughs> <laughs> I think in general, like uh, this tournament offers one of the weakest fields there is. They, really? they, they satellite a lot of people in. Uh, a number of pros don't come, and if they do come, they play later. So playing on day one, I think, is a big opportunity. I mean, I'm looking. I've looked around the room, and I know my table's a great table. Barry says his is, and, I, and you really don't see a table that you'd say, "Wow, I don't, wouldn't want to have to play at that table." I mean, everyone is 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 a decent is a decent uh, opportunity to get some chips together, and uh, I just think that this. That, this is usually a weaker a weaker field than most of the WPT stops that we go to. What do you think about Barry? I mean, from what you've seen so far. Frankly, I just haven't looked around. You know, I just play my table. And, uh, you know, I, I haven't uh, really noticed that uh, there are you know that many players, but uh, that I know, but or that I know. New. That Isn't knew. that a Canadian? It's a Canadian thing, yeah. I said, you know, actually, <laughs> you know, when, well, that's what I was wondering, uh, Gavin. And if I like say out and uh, and oh, you bet a eh, like they do here. Will they be insulted? Like, if I go to France and I make an attempt to speak French, they actually appreciate it. Uh, but if I go to Canada and I, and I say all those words in Canadian, is it an insult? or will they you're, say you're, Bar you're Barry Greenstein, man. You're famous. They're all going to love you here. Okay. Uh, with that, we are going to take a quick break, and we're going to be back with a whole load of poker news since uh, our last show, uh, mostly relating to online sites and such. So we will be back with more of the Poker Road Radio Show. And 
we are back with Poker Road Radio. I'm Bart Hansen, joined by Gavin Smith and Barry Greenstein. And we are going to go into our poker news segment. And boy, have we had a lot of poker news, guys, uh, you know, really having to do with uh, online sites. First thing I want to cover, Barry, you actually just went to Washington, so I know you want to talk briefly about that. Yeah, actually, I think that's the biggest news. Uh, You know, we met with uh, politicians. I'm going to have it in my audio blog uh, if it's not already up there. Uh, And I can tell people that I'm very confident that online poker is going to be back, strong, legal, use credit cards, bank accounts. Uh, It would really shock me if it wasn't within the next six months. Wow. Wow, that's that's amazing. What are some of the things that make you think it's going to go Because we lobbied them. Uh, As a matter of fact, we had a a group of professionals. uh, Why wasn't uh, I invited? Um, well, you're not American. I'm sure that was the only reason. But actually, right. the ones you could tell, the people who were chosen were talkers. Everyone could talk. And the two female talkers at, uh, you know, were Annie Duke and Vanessa Russo. And they get slammed a lot on the forums because they talk a lot. And even when they were talking, I didn't always agree with, with what they were saying. But in that kind of political atmosphere with, the, with Congress people, they're, I know they were always saying, these women are professional players, and they talk like educated people, and a lot of times they didn't understand them as they were explaining poker or whatever, and I didn't know what they were saying a lot of times, too. But just the fact that it made them realize that poker players aren't gangsters, right? that they're actually pretty well-educated people, uh, uh, you know, I, I, that certainly made them feel comfortable with going along with our position that most people play poker in the comfort of our own home for enjoyment, and some of us are professionals play for more money. But just because uh, you know, a few people may abuse it, maybe some underage people play and some people are compulsive gamblers, you know, on a real small scale, that doesn't mean that the rest of us shouldn't be able to enjoy poker in the privacy of our own home. Exactly. And you think, the, you think the politicians bought it? You think that they were... I would say that we almost had a perfect score. We probably met with uh, 30 to 40 Congress people. We split up in groups. And uh, I can only think of one person who didn't say to me afterwards, I'm going to vote for the bills that you guys want us to vote Both for. Both parties, too, right? Both parties. Yeah. I didn't pay attention, Republican or, yeah. or Democrat, because the fact is, a lot of times I even said to them, are you going to tell me you've never played poker? And most of them had played poker. And the other thing that I didn't even realize how this whole system works is they have what are called staffers. That's their, like, assistants right. who write things up and tell them, advise them how they should vote, uh, you know, in their opinion. And these staffers are all under 30 years old, and most of them male, and that population... Plays That's online cool. poker. Absolutely. And we invariably have them saying, you know, I play. I don't know why they won't let me play anymore, stuff like that. They were on our side. That's strong. Well, how did it happen then that, you know, it, was it just a thing that people were blindsided by it because it was tacked on in the back of that Port Act where that's how it just, you know, it just kind of slid by? Well, it, it, it did slide by, and they, were all, they all know that that was the, the, you know, kind of the unfair thing. But it actually was voted on in the House of Representatives of a standalone bill, and it was, it was shot down. I mean, it, they voted to to do the UIJ ban on a standalone, actually, which I didn't even realize until I talked to them, some of them, because it's one of those squeaky wheel things. They hear from their constituents saying, oh, gambling is immoral, you know, I'm religious, whatever. They hear from some of those people, and it's easier for them to vote against gambling. That's a popular thing to do generally among their constituency. Uh, but it's not until we made noise that they said, hey, you know, a lot of people, and they've heard it, you know, a lot of people do just want to play online. But the real truth is the biggest thing that turned the corner for us is the European Union is uh, wants to, has a case against the United States for up to $100 billion in sanctions because we're denying trade through the World uh, Trade Organiz- Organization Agreement. That meant that they knew they had to do something. Right. And so now, now really all they're looking for is a way to ease it over to their constituency and say, we have to do something. It's fiscally responsible to do something, and it's not as bad as you guys think. That's they're really going they're to trying. be liable for these sanctions through the WTO, right? You're right, definitely right. So, violated. So it is going to happen, and what Barney Frank said in one of his bills is the main bill, is he said as soon as he knows there are enough votes in the Senate, he's a senator, to push this thing through, then he'll put it up. Uh, and, you know, he'll put it up for the vote. He said he just has to count heads, and he just said it's on our, it's on our plate. We talked to enough politicians, get them to agree to vote our way. As soon as he sees it's right, it'll be put up and go through. So that's why I can't tell you a date. What I can tell you is on November 6th, there's going to be just a hearing about Internet poker. Uh, at the world, they'll have some experts, and they'll have one professional poker player. And uh, that professional poker player is going to testify in front of Congress as me. Wow. 
So if it doesn't make it, you guys can all blame me. Blame if, you. If it, and if it does make <laughs> it, uh, I'm expecting uh, uh, incredible uh, adulation. Well, though. something to move. Al- I mean, something that relates to this. Could these online? You know, we're talking about some of these online scandals that have developed here. You know, the absolute scan. I mean, there's so much information. I want. I want to. You know, my head wants to explode. Basically, in a nutshell, you know, somebody high up in Absolute had access to an account that could view the whole cards. That was apparently a beta testing account. Right. That person then used an account to cheat, win hundreds of thousands of dollars, or speculation that it might have even been millions, dumped chips off to their relatives and friends, and now you know we're up in the air as to what's going to happen now. Poker stars, they the void. The guy was, you yeah, know, right. he, he got his thing for multi multi accounting. I don't, no, I, not, I don't no, think that's you, not true. I don't think you can compare those two. No, things. No, 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 no. I'm po- just saying. I think poker stars. The the, the man played. I, from what I gather, he played multiple accounts. No, 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 initially, that's what people thought. Uh, but, you know, they thought Mark Telcher, whose sister's name on the account, played that. But they actually do know if you read the threads. Everyone initially said, oh, multi-accounting. Play multi-. That's actually apparently not what happened. Uh, Mark didn't play that account, uh, we've learned. And they, you know, we also think his sister didn't also, although Mark claims he did. Whether someone else played the account, which is what I think happened, uh, or not, Poker Stars isn't giving us the whole, the whole thing. And what they're saying is they denied the money to the guy who won, but they don't want to tell us everything they know at this point because they expect to be sued, and they don't want uh, the people who are suing them to be able to prepare their case. So they don't want to let you know, the right. other people know everything. But once the case goes to trial and is over, I think then we'll get all the exact details of why they denied the money to the first-place uh, finisher. And again, you know, that's not even in the same realm of possibility with the thing with this absolute thing. Does, can this absolute thing possibly hurt what you were trying to do now with online poker? Well, I actually was very prepared to put a positive spin on it because I think there is a positive spin. What I was going to tell the politicians is if online poker was legal in the United States, uh, you know, then we would have an overseeing board that would have been an independent investigator from the start. You know, I think most people in America felt helpless that there was no one to appeal to. And that's what happens when you have uh, these sites in third world countries. Not that Canada is a third world country. That's where I think that thing is an Indian reservation. But a lot of the sites are based in some of the smaller countries. And so American citizens who make up about 75% of the players feel like there's nowhere they can go. There's no one they can turn to to say uh, things aren't right. I think, uh, you know, I was cheated. Of course, a lot of people... Say that they're cheated uh, just because they uh, someone did a two outer on them. This uh, the evidence was overwhelming mm-hmm. from the hand histories and even before that that something funny was going on. But really, people didn't have anywhere they could go right. with it. Well, you make a good point with that too, because like, even myself, I mean, I you know I represent full tilt. Um, I play online, uh, and, and I mean I I'm probably in the upper echelon of people that are educated about online poker. And you're, you're mentioning that they think that poker stars feel they're going to get sued by the person who got the money withheld, and. I wouldn't have a clue in the world as how to to launch a lawsuit about against an online company. So I think right. you're, you're probably right, yeah, but, but people just have no idea. That's right. Put it in America, and I think American citizens will all feel a lot more comfortable. It'll really be – we'll even have more poker players because they right. will know that, you know, just like the Better Business Bureau, it doesn't even have to be people who are that sophisticated about poker. Frankly, for the most part, the Internet sites do police themselves because – that helps them get customers. Right. They have to make sure it's an honest game, or people just aren't going to play. I there. mean, if it was if if online poker was legal in the United States, the absolute employee that that did this could probably be tried. You know, in, in the United States, and a lot it's, of people it's are a criminal are, offense. Right? You know, one of the things, and again, I don't think it's really right for Gavin or I to slam absolute poker without all the facts because we represent other sites. So you could, you know, someone could say that. Uh, we could potentially you have your be own biased. interests or something. So I, it's I, better I, that it's on one of the other shows. But people are already saying, well, if this was a criminal activity, why wasn't that? Why isn't a person in jail right. or arrested and pointed out instead of just saying some rogue employee did something? Well, so it's, it's almost like where does the jurisdiction lie? I mean, the servers are in Canada on an Indian reservation, right? And, you know, from what I've read, you know, who necessarily has jurisdiction over a rogue programmer or, or absolute higher up that has committed some sort of illegal activity? Right. And you I'm know? hoping, like I said, there's another thing. Once we get this stuff legalized in the United States, you know, ultimately we want to actually get the companies in the United States. And, you know, obviously the United States is my favorite country because I live there. But I think the main reason it should be there is because most of the people pl- who play are from the United States.
Now we're going to move along here as we're kind of doing a little bit of a short show here on our first uh, Poker Road. Uh, I'm going to introduce, we're going to be introducing a couple of concepts. Um, one thing that I'm going to be doing, which is called uh, Cash Game Corner. And that gives me the opportunity to uh, mention the email, which is prradio at pokerroad.com. Again, prradio at pokerroad.com. We want to keep the show interactive, and we will be reading emails every single day. You can also leave voicemail messages at 877-836-ROAD, 877-836-ROAD. And we're going to take another quick little break here. And when we come back, we're going to go to hand of the day and uh, read an email off. So we'll be back here in a second. We are back here on Poco Road Radio. Tomorrow we are going to be going more over the website, some of the shows that are going to be on the Poco Road website. Again, back here with Gavin Smith, Barry Greenstein, and I am Bart Hansen. Um, hand of the day here, it was an interesting hand that happened early on. Um, and, you know, I don't really know how you get away from this, and I wanted to ask your two guys' opinions. This is about flopping a set early on in a tournament. Um, Reedy Campbell bets 250 pre-flop, two players call, including John Little. And then the guy in position re-raises to 1,000. All call. Campbell, the flop comes out jack, nine, eight, rainbow. So you've got a pre-flop raiser, you've got a caller and a re-raiser. Now all three call. Everyone checks. The pre-flop raiser bets 10,000. We talked about how this is kind of an, you know, you said there's a little bit of amateurs in there. Huge overbet on a jack, nine, eight board. The guy calls. Campbell makes the call in between. And Little, who is out of position, now moves all in for 17,000. Now, it ended up being that Campbell showed pocket jacks. The guy that check raised all in showed pocket eights. And the original preflop raiser showed pocket aces. So the question I have for you is, if you see that type of action on a board like jack, nine, eight in a tournament, how, how do you get away from like a bottom set type of hand? Well, 10,000. The preflop well, raiser makes a huge overbet, right. and now a guy makes a call. Right. Well, let's between. make one thing clear. Most, uh, most of the time that you flop a set, you don't get away from it. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, if it happened to go where there was a big $10,000 bet, and then Ronnie Campbell makes his $10,000 call, and you're sitting on bottom set, you've got to ask yourself, what kind of hands would, would he make this call with? You know, would he call this with a, with a pair or two pair? That seems unlikely, right? So his most likely hands there are probably a bigger set or a flop straight. You know, if he had to call the 1,000 before the flop with a queen 10 or something like that. And, you know, given that, then you have to decide, you know, what, whether or not you think he's on the straight and you want to gamble and try and get a ton of chips up early or whether you want to dump. You, you, you could conceivably dump it, but most of the time you flop a set. It's just getting in there. Yeah, the main thing that I always tell people about tournaments, uh, it's the one, one aspect where it's very different than, than side games. A lot of people tell you in a side game the way they make money is by saving uh, chips when they have the worst hand. You keep saving money when you're in a tournament, and you've got, you and I have discussed this before, Brett, or Brett, Bart. Uh, <laughs> Come on, Brett. <laughs> yeah, I discussed it with Brett, but I'll discuss it with you now. Um, you keep saving money by making good folds, you're out of the tournament. Right. Yeah. And so you really have to pull the trigger, and you have to say, okay, this is my uh, through ticket to the, uh, in this case, to the next day, and eventually to the final table. You get these hands where you say, I've got to win this pot to have good chips and, and do something. A and uh, even when you make the wrong call, you say to yourself, if I had won that pot and had a lot of chips and been right or drawn out, what I would have been able to do with those chips is just steamroll people and really build a stack and have a chance to win the tournament. You're here to try to win the tournament, and you're not here just to try to end up a little bit ahead of what you started with, like in a cash game. Right. And I'm going to quickly go to one email here. You're not supposed to say right all the time. You're supposed to say, no, you ignorant. No, but I agree oh. with you this time. Most of the time, I'm not going to agree with you. Okay, okay. Because, you know, one. our strategies well, differ so much. Day, maybe, but in this yeah. particular one, Well, I mean, you're always trying to uh, save chips right in the tournament, right, Gavin? Um, well, <laughs> I, you know, I, I do more than you think I do. But, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, I, if I flop a set there, i, I got to be honest. My money's probably going in as well, you know? And, unless it's such a nit, like Twan Lam... No, no I'm going to just don't know what he's talking <laughs> Twan Lam was at the final table. Yeah. No, it, it's such a nit that I know the guy just doesn't have him in it, have it in him to uh, raise without a straight or, or a set. You know, there, I could potentially get away from it. But normally in tournament, you just don't know the people well enough to do yeah. it. How, how disgusted are you on that, on that board if it turns out that the money, you fold your set of eights and uh, the first guy shows pocket tens and Ryan, he shows pocket aces, which, yeah. is, which is a hand the way it could conceivably could play out, out you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. you're like, oh, this is really, really sick. I yeah. guess it's speculative. We don't have time to go in for it. It's speculative overcall with aces, though. I mean, that's an interesting thing there with, you know, with two people basically. That, right. that yeah, yeah. aces front. should probably get away yeah. at that point. Uh, so Twan Lam's going to come in here in a second. Uh, quick email here from Andy in the UK. Again, you can email us at prradio at pokerroad.com. And now that I'm in town, 
email your cash game questions as well as the, uh, we go into uh, cash game corner. Andy says, and I'm going to sum up this email because I'm not going to read it word for word. He made a raise in a tournament that basically he, got re he made a raise in late position and the big blind re-raised him all in. And he got three and a half to one on the call. He had ace 10. He knew he was behind because the big blind was such a tight player. When is it proper to dump the hand when getting correct pot odds to save your life in a tournament? Uh, well, that, uh, to me, that one would solely depend on, on how much chips you have. I mean, if I'm getting short and I'm getting three and a half to one, I'm going to call anyways. I mean, yeah. what do I care? I mean, I'm, I'm getting the right price against ace king. But uh, if I've got plenty of chips and I'm getting three and a half to one where I can comfortably fold the hand and still be still have a comfortable stack then i might uh choose to fold in that in that case but that it, it would it would st entirely depend on on my on chip position on my chip stack yeah. getting three and a half to one pre-flop yeah getting three uh, and a half to one i don't remember making many folds in that yeah. situation no matter what the i guess like you haven't said you could have so many chips against a chip leader and you still have good chips you fold that just doesn't come up very often but we are gonna we're gonna take another break and we will be back here with our guest tuan lam on the Poker Road Radio Show. And we are back here at WPT Falls U. I'm Bart Hansen with Barry Greenstein and Gavin Smith. Um, today's guest, Tuan Lam. Tuan, thanks for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Can you tell us how your tournament's going here so far? We're about, you know, at the dinner break, halfway through day one. What's going on? Um, I feel very good right now is... Um when I first started today, I didn't uh, have much um, uh, big hand, but uh, I got lucky uh, just after the second round. I got um, a couple uh, uh, aces, and uh, it's all pay off, and uh, I got a little bit of chips, and I feel very good about it. So. How much do you have, Tuan? I have about 50,000 right now. Damn. That's good chip. 50,000. Of course, we started with 20, so... Two and a half times what we started yeah, with. Average is about 25 right now. Five, so double the average. Of course, everybody knows you now from your second place finish at this year's main event. $4.84 million. You had two previous caches at the World Series in 06 and 05, and also you finished second in a WCOOP event through Poker Stars in 05. Um, you know, when you guys got down to 10, it seemed like you were the tightest player amongst the entire final table. Was that your strategy going in to move up the ladder? Tell us about what you were thinking about going into the um, final day. Yeah, when, um, when I first sat down on the final table, my strategy was just, uh, just to relax and sit back a little bit, uh, wait until the table getting shorter, and um, I start playing more aggressive. But too bad when um, when the table gets shorter, but my chips get shorter too, so I couldn't do anything about it. So I, the only way I can play is uh, uh, play a little tighter. Yeah, know. I was wondering, you know, uh, although people criticize Jerry Yang's play, he was making it tough on people to come in with marginal hands because he, he let everyone know he was playing for all his chips just about every hand. So I would assume that made you throw away some questionable, like, Jack-10 offsuit type of hands where... You know, you don't want to, you know, you figure, I, I don't want to come in, he's going to raise me, or, or I don't want to call a big pre-flop raise. Is that what was going on also? Um, to, uh, to play against Jerry, I think is, uh, my strategy at that time was to, to, to find a, a decent player, I mean a decent hand to play against him because uh, I know Jerry would calm me down with anything and he would gamble. With right, and we saw Philip Helm make, you know, what I thought was a real big mistake. You know, a guy Ooh. who's over-raising... <laughs> a guy who's over raising, you don't just decide. You know he doesn't always have good hands, but you can th that guy. You can wait on a hand. You know you can say, okay, he's going to put that much in. I'll wait till I get a hand because then I'm going to win a lot of money. He'll win a little, but he'll lose a lot. Now the guy calls him with eight five of diamonds. That's not the right way. Your your strategy of waiting until you really had something, I think, is better, especially because in these tournaments at that tournament you make so much money moving up the ladder. I wanted to ask you about hand number 92. Now, I looked over the entire hand history this afternoon looking at the, the final table. You really weren't that involved. Um, you know, again, probably the tightest player at the table. Hand 92 is an interesting... You, 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 you. He's, he's our guest. Are you calling him a nit? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. 4.8 million. Hey, you know, I, I think it, we said it was definitely the right strategy. Are you sure it was hand number 92? Hand number 92. I got it right here. You oh. had king, queen, and the big blind, and it was limped around, and everybody checked. Um, I think there were three or four three-way action limped around in the pot, and the pot had about a, a million five in it, and the board came out jack-10-4 rainbow. So you had king-queen, the upper end of an open-ended straight draw with overcards. You led pot, 
and Jerry Yang raised you, so you led for 1-5, Jerry Yang made it 4-5, you fought, and came over the top for 10-8 total. Now, Yang ended up calling there with a hand like Ace-10, so I guess my question is, if he was going to call there with Ace-10, I'm assuming he's going to call there with any weak jack, I mean, or any jack, if you knew he was going to call with Ace-10, and you'd been playing tight the entire day, would you have made that play? Because now you're a coin flip and you would seem to be playing conservatively. So, you know, if he had said, I'm going to call here with ace-10, I mean, is that something that you, you would have played the hand differently? I mean, you did end up spiking a queen at the end and doubling through. I, I am, um, like that hand, I, I gambled with Jerry, too. I know he's got, uh, I knew that he wasn't going to call me down, too. But uh, I got two over cards and I'm open-handed straight. I got a big favor, so uh, I move all in. I hope that... Uh, <laughs> Well, obviously you're something. hoping not to get called, right. first yeah. of all. Yeah, uh, first of all, I uh, hope that they didn't but, uh, call me. I guess everyone was hoping Jerry wouldn't call them, didn't get their wish. Of course, yeah. some fairly of them were lucky. It's fairly surprising the way that action went that Jerry did make the call with a hand as weak as ace 10. I mean, he was getting about, mm. I mean, when he comes back over the top for the 10.8, it was about uh, it was about 17.5 and another 10, the call, so about 1.701 or something like that. And I was just saying, you know, if he's going to call with a hand as weak as ace 10, does it mean that after he raises, there's no fold equity there? <laughs> there might not be. You know what I mean? Up. And that's that's kind of the thing. I still I, was... I still take um I still take a chance with that hand because uh, um I didn't know that Jerry fifty fifty that he wasn't gonna call me my all in raise, and so that's um that's what my point is try to go all in and hope he lay down with a weak kicker, and um, I still have a draw if he calls me. Yeah, you got to so. realize, so like from Twan's point of view, he was playing so tight. He 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 figures the one time he makes a play, they'll they'll give him credit. Right. But uh, I guess Jerry wasn't giving anyone credit. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jerry, Jerry called me down with anything. I that's why I I knew Jerry. That's why I played a little tight. Uh, at at uh, at the final, at the um, at the end, just me and him had stuff, and I'd still got a two uh, two three big ten, and um, I. Um, I decided to just call him instead of move all in and gamble with him. Yeah, you know, and one thing I was wondering from your perspective, you hear people criticize Jerry Yang. We know he's not a real, a real experienced player. But when you get to one of those final tables and some guys uh, uh, using, uh, I'm going to use uh, 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 Rain Con's terminology, uh, terminology, bulldozing the final table, which is what right. Jerry was doing, it can really put a lot of pressure on you. You feel helpless if you don't pick up a big pair, really. Yeah, yeah. Even if you pick up two big cards, you know, you say, well, you know, guy's going to go play two fives all the way or, you know. So did you feel that kind of pressure from him? Um, I actually, I, um, I didn't feel any pressure against Jerry because um, I, I got to know myself first that I have to play a real hand against Jerry. So every time I go all in the, uh, t to play against, has stuff with him, I got to be, get ready for myself. So... Now, there was a hand towards the end there, too, where Jerry had opened up for two and a half million, and you made a push with ace five. I'm assuming thinking, you know, Jerry can't always have a hand here. That was down when you were four-handed. Rami woke up with queens, and you spiked an ace. Yeah. And, it, you know, it doubled you back up to 20 million. Um, you know, so, you, I mean, basically you just thought that Jerry was just opening with a super wide range. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I know Jerry is, uh, he was uh, very aggressive at that time, and it was three players left. Uh, I was small blind, and he raised on a button. And um, at that time, I, I tried to gamble with Jerry, try to get uh, the other man out uh, out of the hand. But once he called me and said, I'm done, uh, I knew that I was beat. And um, I was lucky that I hit the, 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 the ace on the flop. But I played Jerry that hand. I, I don't play. Didn't know Rami uh, was going to wake up with Queens right yeah. behind you. Not to mention the fact, with from what I saw with Jerry, I mean, you could get called and have the best hand with ace five. I mean, he made a pretty big call against that calmer guy with with jack ten yeah. uh, pre flop. He was definitely doing some gambling with All that. Right. Short I think side. he was willing to play. You might have the best hand to get called. <laughs> I mean, the, the, to double up. You know, the real interesting question is: Is it correct if you looked at the last few main event winners? Is it correct to play that big pot poker style with that type of money on the line? Like Barry said, when you know that guys are trying to move up the ladder and they're going to fold hands that they would normally play with because they don't want to gamble an extra million dollars to. You know, in this hand, I mean, you I, know. I mean, I think Jerry probably went in, uh, probably went into that table. Um, definitely one of the two or three weakest players at the table, and found a strategy to get himself in the, uh, to give himself a shot to win. So I mean, I, it's hard to knock him for 
Yeah, I thought, uh, yeah, I mean, I think everyone at this point realizes that he played, I think the word is effectively. Right, right. He did some good things. Uh, You maybe made some bad calls, but even his bad calls put people on notice that you're going to have to play for all your chips if you play a pot with me, and that can put a lot of pressure on. You know, Maury Escondani, who did the, the, uh, uh, you know, his, his, his uh, company was involved with the pay-per-view. He mentioned that when Stu Unger won his, uh, the World Series, I guess in 1997 or 8 or whenever it was, he was over-opening all the time and just doing the same kind of thing, and they called it brilliant. Right, right, right. Jerry Yang does it. He's an idiot. <laughs> and you know, obviously Jerry Yang's not Stu Unger. But still, you know, the strategy, you know, I've been there. Guy just plays like that. It puts a lot of pressure. You've got to pick up a hand. It's the number one type of opponent that I don't want to play with. You know, I hate playing That's against That's right. Players. You're always trying to make small pots. I hate playing against guys that just will not let me see flops. And uh, so someone yeah. who does that and puts it up to you, then, you know, it's, it's a tough guy to play against. Yeah. Now, I, I was wondering a couple of things, Tuan. Uh, someone said to me that that was your first trip to Las Vegas. Uh, no, actually, I went to Vegas a couple of times before that. Did your uh, wife know about those other ones? Maybe that's the first time you told her or something. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no um, yeah, the last two times uh, I went by myself. And, um, See, I knew it. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, uh, I said not nah, there she is. <laughs> actually, you I only speak Vietnamese, right? She doesn't know what I'm saying. Good. I didn't do any good at uh, those two tournaments. Um, uh, first, I, I thought about the game. I, I when I went to the field and I, I looked at the field, I said, "It's a big field. There's no way that I can go that far." So I get frustrated sometimes. And uh, yeah, tournaments are tough. Well, have you played tournaments since the World Series before this one? Have you played any big tournaments, any WPTs? Have you traveled? Uh yeah, I went to uh, L.A. and played one um, just uh, after the uh, World Series. The bike, okay, right? The bike. Did you yeah, didn't try the, the World Series of Poker Europe? Uh, no, I um, uh, right now I'm with Poker Stars, so I gotta travel a lot to that, to play. That's what I wanted to ask you. Now you're sponsored by Poker Stars. Now this tournament really is right down the street from you, right? Yeah, just about an hour away. Mm-hmm. But you're gonna be traveling the WPT circuit pretty much and representing Poker Stars now. Uh, no, actually, because uh, Poker Stars yeah. want me to go to Asia. Oh, for okay. Now. Yes, so you're gonna go to Mac- the, um, Are you going to Macau? Yeah, I'm going to Macau, and um, after that I'm going to Australia. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm- Macau is the day after Thanksgiving. Mm. I, I guess you're from Can- Canada and Vietnam, so Thanksgiving is not a big deal. I mean, what a wonderful opportunity for a guy like you. You know, they talk about how Asia, the poker, you know, boom really hasn't happened, but it's just waiting there. You speak, you know, Vietnamese, obviously you're from Vietnam. Uh, what do you think the future is over in, po- uh, in, in poker? I think if people, um, uh, Asia, Asian people, they like uh, to play cards be honest with you like i know a lot of people like they love to play cards and if uh if they have a chance to play poker in asia i think it's the um, um game is gonna be booming for asia yeah and you know scotty and men go over there and they've they've probably fathered like 50 kids by now will all be poker <laughs> players so we got you know the next group's coming up <laughs> excuse me now, are you still playing some cash games online? You know, that's where people knew you going into the Baby Han 200, 400 limit hold'em specials. Limit hold'em was more of your specialty, right? Yes. Um, you know, and you'd played in, obviously, some no-limit tournaments. Uh, is that something that you're continuing to do as well? Uh, yeah, right now I play, um, I'm with Poker Stars, so I play on Poker Stars. And, uh, How many times do you have to say Poker Stars for, <laughs> for a <interview? laughs> No, like So you're uh, saying you're with Poker <laughs> Stars and not with Full Tilt <laughs> Poker. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're saying here? I mean, I, I wasn't sure if you might be with Full Tilt Poker. Uh. So I play online. I play, uh, I play 200, 400. Um, I actually, I, I noticed play you, one had, two. you had a real good record in sit and goes too. Those are no limit sit and goes, right? You did uh, that before the World Series, didn't you? I, I didn't play much. Okay, I, um, okay. I just play a couple um, games. That's it. I, 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 they're, they're all good. They're good players. Yeah, uh, I, I was wondering one thing that uh, that occurred to me. Uh, you know, Jerry Yang won, but people don't feel that he's going to be going out traveling around the world, you know, because kind of a humble guy, family guy. Did you ever think that maybe you could be the poker ambassador for this year because you were the second place guy and the first place guy isn't like Miss America, you know, using the crown and going around? <laughs> did that ever, you know, did you have, ever think of that, you know, signing with poker stars? Uh, no, I'm just with Poker Stars. I, I can't be like, uh, yeah, I'm not that. as good as Jerry. Like, uh, but my you know English. what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, you know, if he chooses not to, you know, it's your opportunity to step up and, you know, fill that role possibly. Yeah, as a matter of fact, you're the f- very first guest on Poker Road, which is probably about an equal achievement to coming in second in the main event of the World Series of Poker. Oh, if not more. And, you you know, you were chosen because you live in Canada and because, you know, uh, of your great accomplishment this year in the World Series. 
And because Gavin's uh, one of the co-hosts, so we couldn't have him. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never come second in the world. Well, yeah. he's second in a different event. It just didn't pay four point eight million. Yeah, right. But uh, yeah, that must. Uh, I've never been there at the final table, the main event. And none of us here have either. But we all, uh, uh, you know, it's, it has to be a really amazing thing to go through. You know, a lifetime. You know, something that. Oh yeah. Just a life yeah. life experience. Yeah, I, like. Um I uh, when I f- when I came down to the final table, like I was shocked, like I couldn't realize myself that I go that far because. Uh, but during the game, I pay I play very attentionly, like I p- pay a, a lot of attention to the game, focus to the game, and uh, but I I never thought that I went that far because I knew there's a lot of good players in the. And, and I mean, how did you grade your to get there? Obviously, you all, everyone needs luck to get that far in a big tournament. Uh, did you do any things that you felt were like kind of stupid? You got all your money in real bad outside of that ace five, maybe a, low, a lower pair against a higher pair, but you hit a set and you got real lucky. Or did you just feel that pretty much you stayed out of trouble and played well? What, what was your assessment? Um, like every hand I get involved, I um, I pay a lot of attention. Like I focus to the game and to the player. I want to make sure that my I'm safe and um, and my hand is like uh, I got more chance like uh, I got them beat or before the flop or whatever like one time uh, Gus Hansen he he go on top of me with pocket tens and I re raise him with pocket queens I push him all in and I hope that uh, I knew that I got him beat and I want him to call me right but what was sway. And he flopped to ten. That just right. Just, be, yeah. So what you're saying is you didn't put any bad beats on anyone along the way. On um, the bad beat, um, I don't remember if I had any uh, put on my, any bad beat. Yeah, usually we remember the ones that got yeah. put on us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe you go through that kind of tournament right. and don't suck out a few times. Almost but, impossible. Yeah, and that, well, one of the other things I wanted to ask yeah. you as we wrap up here is, you know, you got. You had the ace queen against the the pocket eights, which was obviously a coin flip. Then you flop the queen. So let's say you you won that hand, and now you're closer to even. You had played even. You know you were down eight or nine to one in chip count early on, heads up. And I saw you played pretty conservatively. It was you know you, you flopped the king one hand, and you check check checked it. And you just kind of let him bluff. Were you gonna change your strategy as if you had won that hand and had gone closer up to even against him? Oh yeah, after if I won that hand, um, my strategy is is gonna be changed completely. I got like a little bit of chips, and I'm gonna play more aggressive and uh, try to um, pull out a little bit of uh, bluffing. Right. Yeah. Uh, Actually, I'm wondering. You know, a lot, of, a lot of times, what we say about tournaments is only one person's happy. The guy who wins it. Exactly. And here you came in second, 4.5 million. You were pretty short a lot of the way in the final table, and then you got rivered after uh-huh. you flopped the queen. So my question is, when you walked away from that table, second place, the main event, is that true? You were pretty unhappy at that point. Uh, no, actually, I was shocked when I see the last card came out. Um, uh, the six was uh, the running river straight card. Cards. Yeah, running straight. Yeah. Uh, my strategy was, my plan was, if I won that pot, I would change my strategy a little bit and now play more aggressive against Jerry because I knew that he would call me with any two cards and I'm going to play, you know, like uh, try to bluff him, this and that. But... Uh, too bad it didn't work out. So I, I this is the only thing that uh, that uh, that my brand, my plan broke up. Like, uh, but I was very happy with the money and the chem sack. And it's uh, Jerry's. Uh, Jerry's a nice guy, and he did all the job. Like uh, at the final table, he did all the job. Yeah, for, you mean job of knocking everyone out for yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> so he deserved it. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. Well, Tuan, I want to uh, thank you very, very much for being our first guest here on Poco Road radio and good luck to you in asia and at this falls view event thank you very much it was nice to meet you thank you very much thank and you. we will be back thank here you. in a second with more poker road radio and we are back wrapping things up on our Inaugural show of Boca Road Radio. Yeah, that means first. First. Nice. Yeah. You speak English in the U.S. Well, I was wondering, now that I'm subbing for... Oh, are we back? We are back. I, now that I'm subbing for Joey, do I have to sub for his prop bets against Gavin? I heard there was something they were going to do, like in barrels over the falls or something. Do I have to do that? Yeah, you have to go over the falls. <laughs> but good news, if you make it, I owe you like $10,000. 
Uh, I heard you haven't paid him from the last prop bet. Well, the <laughs> <laughs> something like I'll that. Coll I'll collect. All right, well, more on that tomorrow. We're going to have Barry Greenstein in here tomorrow, as we will all week. We're going to go over the Poker Road website tomorrow in detail as well. So thank you all for joining us, and tune in tomorrow as we will be back from WPT Falls View.